Welcome back to the second installment of my devlog series where I will be building an 8-bit CPU in Rust. When we last left off, we were hand building chips and using the plugin copy paste to save our work. We ran into an issue where copy paste would spawn bugged electrical components that could not have their state updated. This would lead to inconsistencies within our schematics. To solve this, we began working on a plugin, since the time it would take to fix copy paste would be about the same amount of time as writing our own plugin. First, we would set up a dev environment which consisted of my laptop running the server and having a file called rustcircuitboss.cs within the plugins folder. I would then use the extension remote ssh within VS Code to ssh into my laptop and open up the oxide folder in VS Code. This gave me access to my laptop's file system, as well as give me terminals that I could access as well. Once that was done, I began the arduous process of learning Oxide. First, I learned how to create a plugin class that Oxide could load, and then learned how hooks work as well as player commands. Next, I went over the internal data file system stuff that reads, writes, and automatically handles serialization of classes into JSON files. I then next tried to learn how to split my code up between multiple files, which is a pain in a butt to do within Oxide. If you think about how C-sharp works, we basically compile all of our C-sharp files into machine code, and then our computer just executes and runs this machine code. This requires Oxide to run a C-sharp compiler alongside the Rust server and loads our C-sharp files up and then compiles them on the fly and links the plugins into the server. So right now Oxide is in this weird space where they cannot compile other files alongside your plugin. There is comment magic stuff that links other files, but we will talk about that later. So for now, I settled on writing a single file code base just to get a proof of concept up and running quickly. The first step was reading the JSON files that came from DLS. Every JSON file within the chips directory would be the instruction on how to build that particular chip. So I built some classes that are one-to-one -one conversions with the data from the JSON file, and then deserialized the JSON data into our classes. Once that was done, I wrote some logic that would allow a user to load a project under their ID, and then run another command to build individual chips from that project. A user would then use the command slash C underscore build chip name, and the plugin would load that chip and attempt to build it. This would include building all the pins for the I.O. to the chip, as well as build all of our internal subchips. A subchip could be a normal Rust component in which we would just build that component there and continue to the next subchip. If that subchip happened to be another custom chip, such as a 74LS173, then we would recursively call the build function with that 74LS173 chip as our primary chip. This would run down the chip tree and spawn everything that was needed. The next step was wiring everything up by adding ioEntity.io refs to the ioEntity.io slots on the components, and having those IO refs point towards each other. I currently can't figure out how to get the wiring to display. I have the code being a one-to-one -one ripoff from copy paste, but it still doesn't render the wires. But the wires are there and connected. Quick side note, did you know that electrical components can be wired way past the wire length limit that we have as users? If you think about it, the game doesn't actually send our power through a wire, we just have the output send a higher load to a memory address which points to our target component. Once this was done, I got it up and running and was able to build a primitive circuit called Yo. It contained a couple components and a stupid chip. The stupid chip had a couple of random components as well. I began work on my 74LS173 chip and ran into my first issue. Turns out whenever you have multiples of the same custom chip, we would overwrite the pins for I.O. for this chip instance to the same ID. So we would wire a bunch of components to one of the custom chip pins. Funnily enough, it is possible to wire two components to a single slot. I don't know if it works, but it's kind of cool to think about. So I tried to fix this issue, but the code was spaghetti. It's hard to debug and alter, so I decided to do a quick refactor which lasted about two days. I took all my logic for making signs and made another plugin called Picasso and moved all my logic for interacting with projects and chips to a plugin called JData. This is the only way you can code split an oxide. 
you use a special compiler magic sauce thing to show that you require that plugin, then you use a macro called plugin reference to signify a property on your parent plugin is an instance of that child plugin. Once that was done, I split the build logic up. Pins, building chips, and wiring were their own methods on the actual chip class, which made it easier to debug the code as well as make changes to those processes. The first change was how we identify pins. Before, we would store them in a dictionary with a string for a key and an IO entity as a value. This is how we would reference and find IO entities for uh, certain pins on ID. We would have multiple instances of the same chip and the subchip ID would have a unique identifier, but all the pins would have the same IDs between them. So for example, the clock pin will always have the same ID regardless of which instance a 74LS173 chip is being used. This leads to the last instance of a chip having its pin saved and all wiring leading to those pins. I changed the identifier to use the chip ID in combination with the pin ID which fixed that issue. Once this was done and I fixed a bunch of compilation errors from the refactor, it was all up and running. And this time it could actually build some huge freaking chips. I began on rebuilding all the chips I had built which were the 74LS173, 74LS245, and 74LS183 chips. I then assembled my register and then created my ALU, and it actually worked this time. With some help from chat, I was able to debug my 74LS183 chips and it gave me proper numbers, and I could spawn multiple ALUs and would not run into an instance of my components not having their state stuck. I had fixed the bug. I built a simple clock for my CPU and then began working on my RAM. The first part was building the memory address register, which would take 4 bits for addressing. And then I built a 74189 chip, which is an 8 byte RAM chip. The way this works is you have a 4x4 grid. Each one of those grids is a 4 bit value. If we look at our address of 4 bits, the first 2 bits signify which row we want to select, and the last 2 bits signify the column we want to select. And that is how we grab a certain 4 bits from our RAM as well as write. We use two of these 8 byte RAM chips so we can store 8 bits across them, 4 in each. And this together gives us 16 bytes of RAM. I went to go build this in game which is around 20 to 30,000 components and we ran into a fatal crash. It ends up trying to find a chip that doesn't exist or something. I'm not sure since at the time of writing this script that was the last thing I did and I decided to take a break after since this happened after I had been up for 24 hours working on this plugin. So yeah, we're going to leave this devlog here. Hopefully in the next video we will have a working 8-bit computer. If you are interested in seeing the current code, I have the project up on GitHub. Keep in mind it explains nothing, but once we get towards release candidate type code, I will have instructions on how to use it. Check the description for more information. Thanks to everyone who supports my content and tunes into the streams, it means a lot to me. And also thank you guys on a thousand subscribers on my channel. It is now monetized and that means I am a real YouTuber now. Please keep tuned in to see how long the apology speedrun takes.